Welcome to Philosophy 15. Uh, these are unscripted discussions between two philosophy professors. I'm Scott Aiken. And I'm Robert Talese. We are authors of the book, Why We Argue and How We Should, A Guide to Political Disagreement uh, with Routledge. And a second edition will be coming out uh, hopefully soon. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a lot of material. Uh, these are uh, these are discussions about basic concepts in philosophy, standing debates uh, between scholars, issues in the uh, issues in the philosophy profession, and we'll be talking about some of our own research. Um, and the inc one of the important things that uh, that you'll see from all of our podcasts is that we're finding uh, that. Most philosophical issues are complicated. Uh, most solutions to philosophical issues are complicated. Uh, and so this is mostly us doing some open-ended thinking, talking things through. This isn't the final solution to most of any of these, any of these issues. That's right. We want to emphasize that um, what we hope to be doing in this series is not providing uh, any viewer with a uh, final word on any philosophical matter that we're discussing. Uh, this is not a intended to be a um, video cast that's an introduction to philosophy or um, a substitute for taking a philosophy class, uh, students out there. Um, this is uh, just Scott and I uh, unscriptedly talking about philosophical issues that have to do with our um, a collaborative research on uh, argumentation in a democratic society. So, one of the most pressing issues about what we think argument is in a democratic society uh, is about how dialectical must arguments be. And so, maybe a quick clarification as to what exactly that question means. So, dialectical means that it's about that you're taking up with somebody else in an argument, uh, that there are people who are objecting in an argument, there are people who have questions in an argument, there are people who need to be addressed whenever you give an argument. So, uh, this question generally arises from a kind of a uh, from a standing ver view of how arguments work, that there are sort of two components to every good argument, that there's an illative core, the premises and conclusion and the inferences that you make between them, and then there's a dialectical tier uh, to them. This, these terms come from Ralph Johnson's Manifest Rationality uh, 2000 book in Argumentation Theory. Uh, and But the dialectical tier is kind of the more controversial part. Everyone thinks that arguments have got premises and conclusions, but how um, engaged with a debate with a debate model of argument must arguments be? Uh, the Johnson view is that arguments are deficient if they don't ha identify certain kinds of standard objections, if they don't try to clarify an issue for a, a set of and identify a set of questions that they're trying to answer. We don't. You might say the thought is is that we don't argue and we don't generally give arguments unless we've got a disagreement or a question or some worries. So the dialectical tier in the way that you assess di uh, arguments dialectically is in terms of how satisfactory they live up to being able to answer the standing standard objections uh, that are around in, you might say, the intellectual milieu of the argument. Right, and it seems as if some a conception of dialectical success and argumentation is necessary, even if you're going to be able, even if you want to be able to explain, um, for example, why question-begging arguments fail. So uh, a question-begging argument is an argument um, which, in in some way, um, has as its conclusion one of the things that's asserted in the premises. Now, uh, on standard uh, models of how we assess at least um, deductive arguments, um, one way that an argument begins to succeed is if, in fact, the truth of the premises entails the truth of the conclusion. Now, it looks as if, in a question-begging argument, that desideratum is going to be satisfied, right? Today is Wednesday, therefore today is Wednesday. Looks like, oh, okay, if today is Wednesday, then the conclusion... It's such as valid, it's sound! Yeah, well, that's the other thing. <laughs> a, a sound argument is a valid argument with true premises. Right. So it looks as if a question-begging argument with a true premise, and therefore with a true conclusion that is identical to the premise, looks like it satisfies, right? The two sort of central conditions for um, 
or nested, we should say, conditions for um, at least deductive success in an argument. Today is Wednesday, therefore today is Wednesday is a sound argument. That means it's also valid. So it looks as if that's a success. There's a clear sense in which question begging arguments though are argumentative failures, and you can't diagnose the failure of a question begging argument except by importing some conception of the dialectical right. work. Right an argument supposed to do. That is the kind of work the argument is supposed to do with respect to a critic or an interlocutor or somebody whose reason is being addressed by means of the argument, who one is trying to convince by means of reasons to adopt a conclusion or to alter uh, uh, something that they think. So unless you bring that dialectical component of argument in, that is unless you start talking about argumentation, we could say. Right. It looks as if you can't explain just even some pretty straightforward uh, ways in which just formally we say arguments fail. Right. And so one of the crucial things that we need to have to be able to understand this distinction between the, this illative core, the premises and conclusions, those you might say are just sentences or propositions. Those are just a strictly formal feature of the way that arguments fit together. And you can assess them in, term, in terms of without any sort of access to content. So formal, uh, uh, formal logics, look at P's and Q's and horseshoes and things like that. You don't need to pay attention to the content of the claim. It turns out, though, whenever you're looking at it dialectically, the content matters uh, because those are the places where people are going to be accepting or not accepting uh, those, those propositions. And so the dialectical component of argument is necessary. And so all the stand, uh, many of the standard fallacies, not all of them clearly, but many of the standard fallacies just wouldn't be intelligible if we didn't have this dialectical requirement. As Robert identified, question begging, another obvious one would be the straw man. You can give a perfectly good premise and conclusion version of an argument about the about how some view is stupid, but if it doesn't connect up with the views that others are holding, then it does. Then it's a kind of dialectical miss. That's what a straw man is: is that you've attacked some uh, attacked a version of a view that is successful. You've successfully attacked it, but it's not it's not anybody's view that's in the that's in the dialogue. So, well, can I ask a yeah, question sure. about that? So, I guess I've wondered: is it a condition for the success of a standard straw man that the presented argument, the straw man argument, is valid? No, it doesn't need to be valid, but at the very least it, that one of the ways that straw man arguments are successful with their argument, with their audiences, is that they've successfully, or at the very least they look like they've successfully defeated their their opponents. Moreover, and the important thing here is, it's not that it's a requirement of, of straw man arguments, but you can imagine a straw man argument being valid Oh yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And and nevertheless being a dialectical miss. And so that's the that's the important thing that we wanted to be able to capture, which is you can imagine it being valid and perhaps even being sound about the about the the view that it's that it's criticizing, but right. nevertheless not connecting up with any of the other ones. So is it right then to say that what matters in a, for success in the deployment of a straw man argument really just is this dialectical success, right? The ascent right. of the, the people who you're trying to move. Right. And so certainly the way that we assess whether or not straw man arguments are, are successful in terms of moving their audiences is more just this rhetorical question. Right. right. It's a question of how rhetorically successful they are. And we can talk about, I mean, and it looks like there are ways that we can identify um, ways that, and ways that we can even explain why some straw man arguments are more successful than others. Um, uh, and, and part of it has to do with the fact that whenever you straw man an opponent uh, for an onlooking audience, and this is an important thing about dialectics, is that it's not just that sometimes you need to be able to convince the person that you're talking with, say right. Rob and I are arguing about something, but then we are both looking at the camera to see who we're trying to convince there right. if we have a disagreement. Sometimes I can straw man you, and that may convince the folks in the audience here. Right. It won't convince you because I because I'm not connecting right. up with your views. But it may convince somebody in the audience because you might say they may have a view about you, right? And it's right. like, well, he's he he's got a tendency towards this, and so right. I just key on that. And so ways that we can explain, right? And so you might say there it looks like there's kind of two norms about uh, arguments. One of them is a norm of we want to be able to convince somebody of something. The other norm is we want to convince them rationally, and it looks like those two. That's right. Can, can kind of peel apart, right? That's right, right. And I guess that there's so, if in 
sort of garden variety deployments, forget about what textbooks say about straw man fallacies, right. garden de variety deployments within argumentation yes. of the straw man have this sort of ineliminable dialectical component that yes. what what makes it a success or not has to do with whether it succeeds in carrying the the audience then it looks like we've got um uh another case in which as as we got into this even the sort of stuff that is sort of common fodder within standard formal logic textbooks where there's often not much robust discussion about the dialectical or the sort of real world sort of um, context of real argumentation. It looks as if those are limited in certain ways, that certain clear logical mistakes or tendencies that are mistaken can't fully be explicated except in terms of an appeal to the ways arguments are deployed right. in actual communicative contexts. Right. That looks like um, uh, a robust and uh, important kind of um, philosophical point to make. I think that's right. Okay, good. Um, now getting back to the, to, the, to, to the bigger question that we began with. Um, uh, now it looks like, okay, so even, text, even the kinds of textbook fallacy stuff that you get uh, in formal logic books that often doesn't mention the argument, the argumentation context, the context of real world argument. It's like even if we once we start introducing that, in order to make sense of what the, what's wrong with the straw man, you've got to appeal to the onlooking audience. Right. Um, then uh, the question is, um, well, uh, in order to make sense of good or successful or even proper or minimally decent argumentation, how much? of this dialectical stuff or the argumentation stuff needs to be theorized right right how much of it needs to be brought into to the picture and then pushing forward one more step yeah um if it turns out that in order to make sense of proper argument proper argumentation you need to bring in lots of considerations concerning not just your interlocutor but the, the onlooking party, the the, the 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 onlookers who are being at least implicitly, if not explicitly, addressed by means of the interlocutors' exchange. Um, now we've got a quite okay. What do we owe as arguers to them, yeah. the people who aren't speaking but are, as it were, the onlookers or the consumers or the audience for the interlocutors' exchange? One question. Another. What do we owe them right. as arguers? Another question is, how what are our responsibilities to dialectical partners, right. the interlocutors, who aren't playing by the rules, right? Right? Who themselves are sort of um, uh, being uh, uh, dense, or, or you know, no matter what you say to your interlocutor, she just keeps saying the same thing back to you, right? right? It looks as if if we owe a whole lot both to the onlookers right. and to the interlocutor, um, maybe it looks as if conceptions of democratic politics that uh, make, um, make significant use of the idea that citizens need to be sharing and exchanging, asking for, they need to be playing the game of asking for and giving reasons, um, Maybe it's not such a good idea for democracy to be that invested in citizen argumentation. It certainly is open to a lot of pathologies. Uh, that seems to be, a, again, it's a long-standing worry about democracies that they're sort of just hotbeds for uh, for just the pathologies of reason uh, that we are that we've just that we're open to them. That uh, that and especially if we come to the debates looking to learn from them. Right, and that's one of the crucial things is that if we feel like that we're going to show up to a debate and learn something instead of know something and then look at the debate, right. but it, uh, then you're prime, you're prime fodder. And so it's not just that we as arguers owe things to pe to onlooking audiences. It's that audi onlooking audiences actually owe something to themselves whenever they come to the debates with the hope that they're going to learn something about the issues. So right. that's a crucial thing is that you might say there's an other element of being a good reasoner is being informed. 
uh, and clearly there's a problem. <laughs> there, there's clearly a kind of a there's chicken a, and egg there's kind a of problem. There's yeah, worry there sure. because it looks as if you're right. not going to be able to get informed right. by watching purported experts or purported yes. informed people argue with each other. Yes. So well, they they should, uh, that's, that was too strong. It, it's not clear. You're not going to be able to how. tell. You're right. not going to be able to tell right. whether you're being informed or misled or miseducated about right. an issue by watching purported experts. And so we've either or, got to, and so as a consequence, we've got a kind of a problem, right? So we have a political here. We have here we have a political version of the epistemological problem called the problem of the criterion, which is. In order for me to know that I've got a, got a good criterion for truth, I need yep. to have some truths that uh, truths that I know are, yep. are right to know that this is a good criterion because good criteria sort the truth from the false. Right. But I could I can't have the truths without a, without already having a criterion. So it looks like there's a kind of puzzle at the heart of uh, these sorts of things that is really as old as questions about how knowledge works. Uh, and the great irony is that we came upon it just by asking how dialectical converse, uh, uh, argument has to be, but it turns out that it looks like philosophy is really sticky, that all the issues kind of come as big packages. Thank you. Philosophy 15. See you next time. Indeed.